we're starting to record now, so I'll just start off by introducing myself. Waniwanak Natasawi Samantha Maltes, Nutamas Akunahana Tanin Wapanag. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight. Um, my name is Samantha Maltes. I'm a member of the Wampanoag tribe of Aquina. Um, I'm a student here at Harvard Law School, and I'm so honored and thrilled to be uh, moderating the session we have this evening for the Massachusetts Indigenous, Indigenous Legislative Agenda. Um, we have an incredible panel of speakers that are going to speak um, on their expertise on each of these bills. Um, including the mascot bill, protecting sacred native heritage, the native curriculum bill, indigenous people's day and native educational outcomes. Um, after our panel's over, we'll switch over to a Q&A session. So um, I'll announce that later on after I introduce our lovely panelists. Um, and just to get us started, I'd like to tell you all a little bit about myself and growing up as a native person within um, the Massachusetts public school curriculum. Um, so from ages around five to 13, I was constantly reminded of my state's love for its colonial history and its willful ignorance towards its indigenous one. Every year I reread the same chapter one that discussed how the natives helped the pilgrims survive the first winter then curiously ceased to exist. The ramifications of this erasure are severe. I have encountered people at some of the nation's leading institutions who had no idea that Native people still existed, let alone ever heard of the notion of tribal sovereignty. Those are future leaders in the fields from medicine to politics to business, future leaders who have not given a second thought to the childhood textbook silence when it comes to what happened after the pilgrims arrived. Further, Native students are caught in this cycle of selective memory left to reconcile their very existence with the mistruths perpetuated in the classrooms. That's something that I endured personally as a student, and I know a lot of my Native peers do as well. Um, let alone the fact that tribal nations within the state's very own borders continue to face scrutiny over the inherent rights um, as a result of our inherent tribal sovereignty as a direct result of the collective forgetting of who was here first and the mass desire to separate history from its consequences. Um, without an understanding of the indigenous past and present of the state, we do all of our future generations a disservice. Um, an indigenous curriculum is an integral part of addressing this erasure, as is choosing Indigenous Peoples Day, the elimination of harmful native mascots, the preservation of our sacred sites and items of cultural patrimony, ensuring they return or remain in the custody of our own communities. And we need to better support our native students both in and out of the classroom, for they are our next leaders, our culture bearers, and the next teachers who will tell our history. These are remedies presented through the bills in front of us today. And it is my uh, pleasure to start off with the mascot bill. And so I'd like to do a short intro for our speakers, starting with Shauna Newcomb, who's a member of the Mashby Wampanoag tribe located on Cape Cod. Um, she's a sixth grade public school teacher on the South Shore and indigenous activist. And next up following Shauna, we have Ferris Gray is a Sagamore of Massachusetts tribe at Paca uh, Pogapog. Ferris is also a tribal historian for the Massachusetts tribe at Pogapog. Um, thank you guys so much for taking the time and I'm really excited for everything you have to share. Awesome. Well, thank you every thank you everybody for um, having us here and watching. Like Samantha said, my name is Shauna Newcomb. I'm a sixth grade science and social studies teacher on the South Shore. And I am an indigenous activist. And I'm first going to talk to you today about Senate Bill 247, which is an act prohibiting the use of Native American mascots in Massachusetts public schools. I could, and we were joking earlier, um, I could recite this speech in my sleep because I've had to explain it so many times. And what that tells me is that there's a lot of just lack of knowledge. And it, and, and it comes across a lot of times as people not understanding why Native Americans don't want to be mascots. So I have to be patient, right? We have to be patient and, and they listen. And so what I'm going to say to you is the same thing that I always say is a mascot is an object. We are not, as Native people, just objects. We have a whole culture. We have stories. We have traditions. We are 
just as special as any other race or culture that exists. Okay, we don't want to be made a fictitious character because when you take the human away from a person, you're just left with a fictitious character. We're more than that. Today, you may not recognize an indigenous person because in your head, you might be thinking of, you know, the traditional image of a Native American with feathers, um, you know, a headdress is, you know, what, probably what you've heard, um, not a war bonnet. Or maybe you see that our skin is red in these mascot images. I'm not, I'm not red. Um, and just because I'm not red doesn't mean that I'm any less Native. So to portray that as the image of what a Native American is, it makes Native Americans who don't actually look like that feel, feel like, well, we're invisible. And I guess we're not, I guess maybe I'm not as Native as I thought because I don't look like that picture. I went to a school um, whose rivals were the Braintree Wamps. I am Mashby Wampanoag. I was on the cheerleading team. And every Friday night, we have to get everybody excited, right? The rallies. And there was this chant whenever we played our number one rival, it was Stomp the Wamps. And I felt very, very um, uncomfortable being a part of that chant because to, to those students, right? To my classmates, it was okay to, to speak that way against a whole, a whole group of people. What are we teaching our kids? Are these, not, are these not people? I am a person. I never told anybody that I was Native American because I didn't feel seen and I was ashamed because the only image of Native Americans in schools for mascots did not actually represent us and I'm not a mascot. None of us are mascots, right? You wouldn't have a team of like the blacks. We know that when, we, when I say that, that sounds wrong, right? It triggers something. It should trigger something in your mind that says that's not right. Well, Native Americans is just as morally, uh, morally wrong. I can't say it any simpler. We are people, and when you when you make us mascots, you take that away from us. Ferris, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Shauna. Um, also, thank you, Samantha. My name is Ferris Gray. I am the Sagamore of the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapok. Um, Sagamore is uh, one of our three traditional um, leaders. Uh, basically, translates to um, the war chief. So thank you everyone for taking the time out of your, your busy lives and your evening to attend this. Um, it's really important and our agenda is, is paramount for all of us. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for being here. Um, I'd I like to put it in perspective of why the indigenous people have such a problem with being used as mascots. You have to understand it, you have to take it in context. What happened to the indigenous people here in the Commonwealth? Um, we've been trading with the Europeans for nearly a hundred years before they decided that they wanted to colonize our lands. And during this hundred years, there were no plagues. There was no sickness. The plagues only came upon all of us right before they settled. You know, that's not coincidental. We don't look at it that way. We look at that as a form of genocide. And so before the colonists even arrived on our shores to colonize, a genocide was committed here. 90% of all of our peoples were wiped out dead. And we can kind of relate to that because we're going through COVID now. How has that affected our lives? And just imagine 90% of us dying today, how that would affect you. And that's what we went through. And once 90% of us were dead, the colonists came. Then they just started herding us into what they called praying villages. 
Today we might call them reservations, praying villages. That's what they did to all of us, herded us into these places. And I can speak for the Massachusetts, they took our males away from the families out of the villages, these praying villages as they call them, and they put them in concentration camps. And then when the indigenous people say that's enough, we have to fight for our rights. And then they take more indigenous people and then they place them in more concentration camps because they're afraid that they might actually fight for their freedom. It's just insane we're not portrayed that way, that we are not portrayed as the patriots that were fighting for everything we were. And so once the threat of rebellion, rebellion was over, then they can really assimilate us, a forced assimilation, everything taken away, everything. Our religion, our beliefs, the length of our hair, our clothing, our planting fields, our food sources, our access to the ocean, our children, And especially with the Massachusetts tribe, our name was, we couldn't even have our name. They even wanted our name. It was theirs now. They took everything we were. And this happened. This isn't something that is fabricated. This happened here. And what happened here was the blueprint to how they colonized basically the whole continent. So they didn't just do it once, they did it over and over and over and over and over again. And these things happened by the colonists, by the founding fathers, they push out West, atrocity after atrocity. That's this country's legacy. But you know, no matter how much I would love to travel back in time and try to change these things, we can't. We can't change what happened in the past. So if you fast forward, to where we are today, to where 400 years of where we couldn't be us, we couldn't be us, it wasn't allowed. You were killed, murdered, imprisoned for being who you were. And so now what, now it's okay. Now you can have colonists dressing up as us and as costumes. Oh, that's funny. That's cute. Look at them. They can, you know, put headbands on their youth in schools. Oh, let's, let's play Indian now. Oh, we're honoring you. But we're honoring you. That way of thinking is ridiculous. You can't do the things that were done to our people and then choose the way to honor us. And so when we look at the mascot, when we look at the way you're portraying us. And like Shauna said, stomp the womp. And, and you know, I went to a high school that had an indigenous mascot. You know, teams would, would tell us, we're gonna scalp you, uh, you're savages. And they weren't talking about me, but they were, but they didn't know they were talking about me. They were just talking about the mascot. I mean, it's really important that everyone understands we are not a trophy to be on a mantle or to be on, the, on a billboard or to be on sporting jerseys. That's not us. It's not acceptable for any of the other races, only to the indigenous here. Why? Why? Because the Commonwealth still has a colonistic mentality, conqueror mentality kill the Indian, save the man. They still had that same mentality. And when we speak up and we say that's enough, we run into resistance from town to town that we travel to, to try to educate them. And then we have people not wanting to let go. Shauna brought up Braintree, Womps. I met with their mayor who agreed to take away the imagery, which they did. It's awesome, but keep the name. But keep the name, Womps. And that's really important for my family because they call themselves the, Wamp the Wamps. 
They call themselves the Wamps because of Wampatuck, who was a Saco, who deeded that land to the colonist. And so they think they're honoring Wampatuck by saying, oh, we're the Wamps now. So you're the Wampatucks? That doesn't even make sense. How can you be the Wampatucks? You're not the Wampatucks. I am a descendant of Wampatuck. I am the Wampatuck. You are not the Wampatuck. Stomp the Womp. You want to stomp me? So now you want to fight. Because this is real for us. We don't play Indian. We don't play indigenous. That's who we are. We don't play that game. So when we hear these things, I mean, in reality, should we fight? Should we stand up and fight? Are we being challenged? Or can we talk and have a conversation and say, this is not acceptable. This is a form of racism and it's unacceptable. And so Braintree, what they have done is awesome, but they didn't go far enough. But also in Braintree, they have a new school committee member who ran and won with the slogan, bring back the Womps. And he won. He won a seat on the school committee. He is trying to bring back that indigenous mascot. This is what we have to deal with because we need our legislators to say, no, it's against the law. It's against the law to do this. You cannot do this anymore. And if they don't do it, we're going to have to keep fighting and battling. And this Commonwealth will show the indigenous people exactly how they feel about us. I just say one more thing before I pass on my time. Um, recently, um, this is kind of not related, but it is for, for me. Uh, recently, Massachusetts has upgraded one of their laws. And I, it's, it's a good upgrade. The treatment of hens. That's a good thing. Got to treat all life honorably. But for me, they can pass through an upgrade for hens, but they can't pass an upgrade for indigenous people. Hens? But the indigenous still have to stand and fight, stand and speak, be here today to demand that we are not given the same rights as a hen. Honestly, you can upgrade rights of a hen, but not the indigenous people. That shows me a lot about the way of thinking here, not only in the Commonwealth, but in the United States. So again, I'd like to thank all of you for attending and for coming and listening to us because it is really important. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shauna and Ferris for that discussion. Um, just to remind everyone, we'll open up the chat later on for questions. So if you have something, just write it down and hold on to that. Um, we'll save a few minutes towards the end. Um, the next bill that we'll be addressing is um, protecting sacred native heritage. And I'm so honored to introduce Jean-Luc um, Pierrit, an enrolled member of the Tunica Biloxi tribe of Louisiana. Originally from New Orleans, he now resides in Jamaica Plain. He serves as the president of the North American Indian Center of Boston. Jean-Luc, over to you. Thank you, Samantha, and thank you to everybody. Um, as, as Samantha noted, I am, uh, I am uh, even though as I identify as an indigenous person, I am a guest on these lands. Uh, so I'm very grateful to all of our tribal representatives of, of local tribes that are that are here tonight. Thank you so much for uh, stewarding this land that it holds and sustains us. Uh, I've been asked to talk about an act to protect Native American heritage. Uh, this is a uh, this is a bill which has actually two oh, four uh, bill numbers H three three seven seven H three three eight five. S2239, S2240. Uh, special uh, thanks to our, our Senator uh, Sonia Chang Diaz, our representative, uh, Nika Lagardo, and also uh, members of uh, Massachusetts Artists uh, Leaders Coalition who helped to um, draft uh, the language of the bill. Um, <clears throat> I want to build off some of the themes that we heard. Uh, earlier uh, this evening in regards to mascots, especially uh, what it means to actually objectify uh, Native peoples. 
Um, and I start my I start my discussion uh, with this quote from uh, Chairwoman Cheryl uh, Andrew Small Thace uh, back in 2016 when she said, uh, "Tribal cultural heritage belongs to uh, the tribal community of its origin as a whole, and by tribal custom cannot be alienated uh, from that community by any individual." or group without the express free prior and informed consent of that tribe. Uh, so what does, what does that uh, specifically mean? And what does that mean when we're talking about sacred objects, funerary objects, uh, even uh, at times uh, human remains? And what is the need uh, for this bill when we do have uh, federal legislation, the Native American Graves uh, Protection and Repatriation Act? Uh, when I was born, uh, after nearly 180 years of uh, rec uh, recognition effort uh, by my home tribe, the Tunica Biloxi, uh, we still were not recognized uh, by the federal government. In 1969, uh, an amateur archaeologist or a grave robber uh, excavated one of our ancestral uh, home sites. Uh, and at the, um, at the time of my birth, it was actually that collection, uh, which was then called the largest catch of Indian trade goods was leased to the Harvard Peabody Museum. Um, this is a reality that, uh, that many of our indigenous peoples face uh, when our, uh, when our uh, remains, when our funerary objects, when our uh, sacred objects are excavated uh, illegally uh, and then brought into uh, private collections or even uh, uh, what is the focus of this bill, publicly funded collections. Um, and so I, I want to lay that groundwork first. And I also want to say that even though I say objects, what we're really talking about is our ancestors. Uh, so when we say uh, funerary objects, when we say sacred objects, when we say human remains, these are things that are inter, uh, intertwined. Uh, these are things that are indicative, you know, the spirits, uh, the spirits carry uh, for these objects. And that, that's why uh, they're so sacred. We hear stories uh, at NACOB of students uh, at Harvard going through collections um, and, and feeling just the, the heaviness of uh, being in that space, of being in a space in which ancestors are held captive. And so what we're actually aiming for uh, with this piece of legislation is to tie up uh, some loose ends when it comes to the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Currently, it only uh, affects uh, publicly funded entities that receive federal funding. Uh, for this bill, we're actually targeting all publicly funded entities, regardless of whether they uh, receive federal funding or not within the uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Because uh, as, our, as our, our peoples, as our spirits, as all that we hold sacred is currently being held, it is now time uh, for all of that uh, to go home. It is time for us uh, to be made whole as peoples. Uh, and that is why we are supporting uh, an act to protect Native American heritage. Thank you, Samantha Tikach. Thank you so much, Jean-Luc. Um, the really powerful. Um, so the next discussion we'll have is on the Native Curriculum Bill. Um, I'm uh, sending it back to Shauna and as well introducing um, my relative and good friend, Keisha James, who is an enrolled member of the Wampanoag Tribe of Aquina, um, Gejaraquina in Oglala Lakota. She's a recent graduate of Wellesley College, a union member, a lifelong resident of Massachusetts, and a youth organizer and archivist uh, of the United American Indians of New England. Over to you guys. Thank you so much, Samantha. Um, I'm here to speak about S1529 and H2421, an act relative to celebrating and teaching Native American culture and history. This bill addresses the lack of indigenous curriculum in Massachusetts public schools by proposing that the state works with tribal nations and indigenous organizations to develop a curriculum that will ensure that all children attain cultural competency in understanding native history, cultures, and current issues. School children in Massachusetts rarely learn about Native American history or about the contemporary indigenous peoples who live here, including my tribe, the Aquinnah Wampanoag, as well as the Mashpee Wampanoag, 
the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapog and the Nipmuc, as well as Native people in Massachusetts enrolled in tribal nations throughout the US and Canada. I know this because I attended public school in Massachusetts and was told by my teachers that my people had gone extinct. I can tell you that it is very damaging for generation after generation of indigenous children to be taught a curriculum that largely ignores our existence. It leads to us feeling marginalized and invisible and can also lead to us being bullied. For example, my twin brother was so severely bullied by our classmates for his long hair, which is an important part of Lakota culture, that he was forced to cut it off. My firsthand experience was that we were almost completely erased in the school curriculum. On the rare occasion when there was something about us, it was not presented in a correct manner and often included extremely out of date information. It also often included offensive language and stereotypes. For example, we were taught that Columbus discovered America and brought the Indian civilization. My brother and I were forced to participate in a Columbus Day pageant, an extremely humiliating and dehumanizing experience. It was the first time I felt like I didn't belong in my community and I realized that the pain and suffering inflicted on my people by various colonizers was a joke to my teachers. I think this is part of why indigenous students can often struggle in school. Indigenous children are certainly as intelligent as anyone else, but being made to feel invisible on your own land is not a good feeling. The lack of indigenous curriculum is also very damaging to non-native people. In speaking to youth and adults all around the Commonwealth, I have found a sad level of ignorance about indigenous peoples and issues. I have been asked whether we all live in teepees and why I am not wearing buckskin and feathers. I try not to fault people when they do this because they have been exposed to so little information about contemporary indigenous peoples. I have heard non-native, supposedly well-educated adults say that they thought native people were all extinct or that we deserved what happened to us because we were violent savages or we, we are seen as exotic pets instead of human beings who live, work, study, and raise our families right here. Relatively few non-native people are able to say whose land they live on. There's little knowledge about the histories and cultures of indigenous people, whether genocide, the great dying that happened here even before the pilgrims showed up, tribal sovereignty, treaties, our ongoing stewardship of the land, our solutions to the climate crisis, and much more. There is a barrier between native realities and knowledge and what non-native people know about us. And having proper indigenous curriculum included in the standards is how we can bring down that barrier that has existed for centuries now. It will be important for tribal nations here in Massachusetts to be directly involved in creating the curriculum and training teachers how to teach the material. Washington, Montana, Idaho, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Oregon have passed this kind of legislation and other states, including Connecticut, are currently considering it. I hope that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts will demonstrate its commitment to indigenous youth as these other states have by supporting S1529 and H2421. Thank you. Nice job, Keisha. Um, it sounds like we had very similar situations uh, growing up, experiences, I should say, um, in public schools, which is sad. I'm sorry that you also had that experience. Um, I also have a similar experience on the other end as a teacher. So I teach sixth grade science and social studies, like I said, and um, every year, the first day of school is one of my favorites, but also one of the saddest days of the year for me. And here's why. I get to see 75 brand new faces that I'm going to get really close with over the year. And, you know, they're going to all become, you know, the Newcomb homeroom that will go on forever. And I get to tell them a little bit about myself after they tell me, you know, their interests and all that. And I start by saying that I'm Native American. And they have no idea. They have no idea what Native American means. So I say, I'm indigenous. And I'm, I'm an Aboriginal. I'm a Mashpee Wampanoag. So does that mean you're like from Africa? Those are the responses I get. I have people tell me, other adults, they're still existing? Yeah, here I am. Probably don't wanna say that. Yeah, here I am because I don't look like the Disney princess Pocahontas. 
And that's the only way I can get my students to resonate with me. I have to use Disney's Pocahontas to jog their memory. Do you, now you understand what Native American is. Mind you, they're 12 years old, they're now in sixth grade and Native introduction to Native Americans is in third grade curriculum. Third grade. So why is it that three years after you begin you know, learning about Native American culture and the history of the United States, why is it that you don't know what Native American, what a Native American is? Wait, it gets better. Their school mascot at the time was the Hanover Indians. What? With a, with a headdress and everything. And my students cannot, they cannot make the connection that their logo with the Native American um, headdress and me being Native American, right? There's no connection, they don't get it. That's a, that's a problem. And this is, a, this is every single year like clockwork. So next year on the first day of school, I know what I'm, I'm gonna get. And I'm gonna have to explain to my 75 students. The only thing I wish I could do was be able to be the social studies teacher for the whole grade because I'm only getting to change 75 lives. And there's way more, there's about 200 in the grade that I don't even get to touch. And instead, I have become a token Native American teacher, not, not just in my school, um, all over the state, I've been asked to speak because it's a, for someone who is not indigenous to then educate students on somebody else's culture, I totally understand that's kind of maybe uncomfortable for you. So they often turn to me. All right, I get it. But why do you turn to me? Why do the other teachers turn to me in the first place to educate them on my culture? You went to the same schools, didn't you learn it? No, it starts with the education. The teachers will get the education and will be able to share it with the students accurately because there's only, there's only one of me on the South Shore at that particular school at that particular moment in time. We can't be everywhere. So our job as, as community members that are trying to make a better world for the next generation, we have to choose the right side of history. Teach the whole story, teach it correctly. Explain to your students why it's not okay to walk around with a headdress on, on your track uniforms or your football helmets. Did you earn those eagle feathers? Did you, did you know they're eagle feathers? Do you know the importance, the significance of, of eagles, of feathers, of every part of earth to Native Americans? Do you know that? Then you cannot wear it. You didn't earn it. And I can't tell you how shocked my students are when I tell them all of this. They don't ever want social studies to end because the content, right? What I actually teach is so real and it's raw and they want to know. So we are doing an injustice to the next generation by continuing to do what we've always done and teach one side of the story. Oh, I have so much more I could talk, I could say, but I know I'm running out of time. I will pass it on to the next, thanks. Thank you so much. Um, that, I mean, I have to say too, like seeing the three of us here having similar experience, I think speaks to the need um, very much so. And so I'm just really grateful to hear your perspectives as well. Um, okay, moving next up, we have the Indigenous Peoples Day bill. Um, and so presenting on that, we have Matoi Monroe is a Lakota and co-leader of the United American Indians of New England. In addition, Matoi represents the statewide Indigenous Peoples Day Coalition and Massachusetts Indigenous Legislative Agenda. Um, following her, we have Heather Lavelle is the co-founder of Italian Americans for Indigenous Peoples Day. So over to you guys. 
Popila. Thank you, Samantha. Good evening. I'm speaking from the shared territory of the Massachusetts and Nipmuc tribes today in support of legislation to replace Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day in Massachusetts. The bill is entitled An Act Establishing an Indigenous Peoples Day, and the numbers are S2027 and H3191. I'm going to start by saying that Massachusetts has more than 90,000 people of Native American and Alaska Native heritage. In addition, there are many thousands of Indigenous people here from Mayan, Andean, and other communities who are often misclassified as so-called Hispanics. The two federally recognized tribes in state are the Aquina Wampanoag and Mashpee Wampanoag. There are other tribal nations that are not federally recognized, including the Massachusetts at Ponkapog, the Nipmuc, and other Wampanoag bands such as Herring Pond. Additionally, there are thousands of other people who come from tribal nations outside of Massachusetts, such as myself. I'm starting with this information because many non-Native people in Massachusetts are largely unaware of our presence or our history. I read that 40% of non-Native people said they had never met someone Indigenous, and that many believe we are extinct or that we all live on reservations. We are not extinct. Nearly 75% of Native people do not live on reservations. Since 2015, we have been working in towns and cities across Massachusetts to advise and help bring forward Indigenous Peoples Day resolutions. Sometimes when we go into towns and cities, we have educated people on select boards and city council who say that they, that they didn't think that there were any Native people around. They think that they have no Indigenous people living in their town very often as well. So we go in and present to them and talk to them about Indigenous Peoples Day. And every year, more cities, towns, and school systems across the Commonwealth have chosen to make this change from Nantucket to Marblehead, Somerville to East Hampton, Cambridge to Holyoke to Boston. An increasing number of states have followed suit, including our neighbors in Maine and Vermont. We need this statewide bill because celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day will more properly reflect what should be equitable values in our state. We need this statewide bill because Indigenous people are too often insulted and demeaned, both publicly and privately in some towns where Indigenous Peoples Day hearings take place. Inside and outside of town halls, we have been called cannibals, and heathens and savages told to go back where we come from, asked why we, we asked why we are even there since we are extinct, and physically threatened by people who refuse to learn the truth about Columbus. We should not have to continue to deal with that. Indigenous people have been asking that Indigenous Peoples Day replace Columbus Day since at least the 1970s. Nearly all of us were falsely taught as young children that Columbus discovered America. Well, I'm here to say that indigenous people were not discovered by anybody since we were already here and we certainly were not lost. We did not need to have civilization or spirituality brought to us since we already had many civilizations and beliefs. We had and still have the inherent right to continue to live in our own ways on our own lands. Columbus's policies on the islands where he landed, including slave labor, starvation, sex trafficking of women and girls, and outright slaughter, resulted in the near complete genocide of the indigenous peoples of Haiti, the Dominican Republic, Cuba, and other places where the Spanish invaded. Altogether, Columbus shipped approximately 5,000 enslaved indigenous peoples across the Atlantic, filling his pockets and setting the stage for the transatlantic slave trade and the enslavement of millions of African as well as indigenous people. The Spaniards engaged in many acts of cruelty and murder, such as cutting off the hands of indigenous people to test the sharpness of their blades. 
the brutality of Columbus's actions would reverberate through all the other invasions to come and the tens of millions of deaths that would follow. Celebrating Columbus erases centuries of indigenous reality. It erases the decimation of Taino, Arawak, and many other peoples, and the endlessly spiraling impacts of the transatlantic slave trade that Columbus started. It is an effort to silence us, to make our experience invisible. It has a terrible impact, not only on us and especially our kids, but frankly, it has a terrible impact on non-Native people to pretend it's all right to continue to do this. We don't seek to erase history. We seek to correct it. And what happened is not a matter of interpretation. When a handful of people nowadays try to say that Columbus was not so bad, he was simply a product of his times, all you have to do is read the firsthand accounts of some of his contemporaries, such as the priest Bartolome de las Casas, who came to be horrified by all that he saw. We have been asking for Indigenous Peoples Day to be recognized everywhere in order to educate the public about Columbus and also, even more important, to educate the public about the Indigenous past and present and future of where they live. Indigenous Peoples Day is a positive celebration. It changes the conversation from Columbus and all of the Europeans who would follow to indigenous histories, to our resilient cultures, our contemporary issues, and our continuing presence on our lands. This change is long overdue, and we need support from all of you to make this happen. Wopila, thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Heather Lavelle Matoe. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share this space with you. I live and work on the unceded traditional territory of the Massachusetts and Nipmuc tribes. I'm a second generation Italian American and co founder of Italian Americans for Indigenous Peoples Day. Italians for IPD is comprised of hundreds of progressive Italian Americans across Massachusetts who stand in solidarity with Indigenous peoples in our support of the Indigenous Peoples Day Bill and the entire Massachusetts Indigenous legislat legislative agenda. Our membership includes elected members of the state legislature. We are working to dispel the popular perception that all Italian Americans are pro-Columbus. Many of us feel that a holiday that celebrates the resilience of Indigenous peoples is far more truthful and reflective of our values and one that honors a man whose legacy is characterized by white supremacy, genocide, and colonial imperialism. Any association with Christopher Columbus diminishes our culture and does not appropriately honor the struggles and the contributions of our ancestors. To those who defend Columbus as a, quote, great admiral, who, quote, discovered a new world, we say, stop propping up the writings of a few outlier historians and denying the truth of firsthand accounts, indigenous knowledge, and the vast majority of academic scholarship. Those who continue to peddle myths and mistruths about Columbus rub salt in the wounds of indigenous peoples living with intergenerational trauma and undermine the lessons that we're all trying to teach our children about the importance of critical thinking and historical truth and having empathy. To those who try to justify Columbus Day by characterizing it simply as a celebration of Italian American culture, we say that that is the same logic used by some Southerners who claim that the Confederate flag is an expression of their cultural pride rather than the racist symbol we know it to be. To those who assert that Columbus Day in some way makes up for the terrible religious and ethnic discrimination our ancestors experienced, we say that because of those experiences, we should have zero tolerance for acts of oppression against others. In fact, many of our parents, our grandparents, our aunts and uncles who directly experience anti-Italian prejudice and discrimination are proud members of Italian Americans for Indigenous Peoples Day. We encourage all of our non-Native sisters and brothers to remember that Columbus was purposely introduced and embedded in our country's founding mythology long before large-scale Italian immigration, 
And all of us who are part of this country's dominant culture must take collective responsibility for the false and incomplete telling of our history and for our misplaced adulation of Columbus. The Indigenous Peoples Day Bill is about acknowledging and making amends for one of our country's original sins, the way we have treated the first people of this land. Indigenous peoples are presenting us with a really wonderful opportunity to take a first step toward healing and reconciliation together. And this is truly a gift for the benefit of us all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matoli and Heather, for that. Um, I also want to thank you not just for the work that you're doing um, on this bill, but also for the organizational efforts that you guys put in every year for the Indigenous Peoples Day gathering. Um, thank you again for that. And so um, the last bill that we'll be addressing tonight is Native Educational Outcomes. And so I'll turn it back to Jean-Luc and also introduce Ella Black Owl. Ella Black Owl is an enrolled member of the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma. She is the Director of Employment and Training at North American Indian Center of Boston. Over to you guys. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Samantha, once again to Kutch. Um, and I just wanted to once again thank our, our representative, Nicola Gardo, uh, for her support in filing uh, an act uh, providing for the creation of a permanent commission relative to the education of American Indian Alaska Native residents of the Commonwealth H582. Uh, uh, and the history of uh, the history of this bill actually uh, goes back. Uh, the basis of uh, some of the thinking behind this bill goes back to 2011. Uh, executive order signed by uh, President Barack Obama, uh, improving American Indian uh, and Alaska Native educational opportunities and strengthening uh, tribal colleges and universities. Of course, we don't have a TCU here and uh, here in uh, the Commonwealth, uh, but you're hearing uh, tonight, you're hearing a lot of the um, experiences uh, from students, uh, from educators, uh, in, in a few seconds, I'm going to be uh, turning it over to uh, Ella, who's going to be speaking from the perspective of a, of a parent. Uh, but this, uh, this bill proposes uh, an independent agency, a commission, uh, which will investigate the use of resources from both uh, public and private sectors to enhance and improve the ability of state agencies to provide educational opportunities and improving educational outcomes for American Indian and Alaska Native students in order to further tribal self-determination and to help ensure that students have an opportunity to learn their heritage languages and histories and to receive complete and competitive educations that prepare them for college, careers, and productive, satisfying lives. Um, and, and there are uh, basically uh, two goals. The first uh, being working in partnership uh, with the Department of Education and Department of Public Health to create school-based and community-based program, uh, programs focusing on uh, suicide prevention. Our students are facing uh, suicide rates two times that of their white peers. And of course, you can hear a lot of the, a lot of the tensions that they face uh, within, these, uh, within these institutions. Uh, that exacerbate uh, these, uh, these issues, violence intervention, and the promotion of zero tolerance policies regarding the harassment and discrimination against American Indian Alaska Natives. Uh, and then secondly, uh, the Commission will make recommendations about policies and programs supporting American Indians and Alaska Natives on the ongoing basis to the Department of Education, the Department of Public Health, and the Executive Office of uh, Health and Human Services. Um, and so, as I said, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Ella uh, to bring in uh, some perspective um, as a parent uh, currently with uh, with students within uh, within our public school system. So, Ella. Hello. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, as a parent to a middle school student and a high school student, you know, I think it's very important uh, for this bill to be passed and to have your support. Um, just with even all of the experiences shared this evening, those are things that students face every day. Um, 
you know, they've been impacted. And along with John Luke, um, I'll mention, you know, Michelle Obama. Um, I was reading up uh, a quote she had said, you know, folks in Indian country didn't just wake up one day with addiction problems. Poverty and violence didn't just randomly happen to this community. These issues are the result of a long history of systematic discrimination and abuse. You know, that those are things that are our children, our communities still go through is that history of boarding schools, um, having to deal with, you know, how their grandparents, their parents um, have been going, you know, at maintaining, just making, you know, a way in society, um, even still being harassed or discriminated against. Um, and then also, you know, not even just dealing with the pandemic, but also with the um, the boarding school kids, you know, being found um, on the residential school, you know, that just brings up a whole, you know, folks have probably suppressed that and everything, but, you know, those are things that, um, that historical trauma, you know, our kids are going through and they deal with every day. Um, not to mention in the school systems and in the communities um, being uh, harassed at times or racially discriminated against, um, you know, and sometimes it may even be by teachers. Um, about four years ago, uh, there was a unity conference here and you know, was able to take a few kids over from NACOP and Native Lifelines. And, um, you know, hearing MASHP students share how, when they spoke up to, you know, the educational uh, absence of the history, of our history, or they correcting, you know, co about Columbus, um, the, you know, the, the pushback that they received from teachers, um, the di discipline that they received from teachers. And, you know, it's it's not right and it shouldn't be like that. Um, when they have that, you know, they have that right to speak up because that truth is not told as, you know, several have mentioned and have repeatedly been mentioning, you know, over years um, in support of these bills and, you know, it. it they, they all kind of tied, they all tie together. They all impact um, our kids and their, you know, their studying and their success and the resources that, you know, are mentioned that will be, you know, part of this bill, you know, are very important um, because we do see the, the uh, effect of um, meth and suicide and you know violence, um, whether it be on the reserve reservation or whether it be in the urban areas, um, you know that harassing that racism. Um, my own children, you know, one of them, while well, they both have had long care um, throughout their lives at different times. Uh, my youngest, he is a seventh grader, and he has long hair, and you know he wears it down, and not only has he been harassed just for having long hair, but um, also called derogatory name, um, you know, and, you know, so the added support of um, some schools, you know, they have good, um, good resource officers, they have good uh, staff members that are on top of, you know, trying to help educate about differences, being acceptive, accepting to, you know, differences in, you know, race or life ways. And that's important too is, um, you know, that's part of, the imp important part of this, you know, is we have such a rich, diverse life ways. Each tribe that's represented here, each tribe that, you know, has moved here. I'm from Oklahoma, I'm Pawnee, 
And, you know, there are some similarities, but there are a lot of differences and they're beautiful differences. You know, we have different songs, we have different cultural ways, we have different foods, you know, food sovereignty. Um, that is something that is very important, especially at this time, you know, to nourish our bodies and to, it, it's a teaching, it's even a teaching, you know, uh, moment as well to non-natives and the importance not only like you know you guys have mentioned the uh land acknowledgements but also you know just like i said the life ways we have such a diverse beautiful life ways from all of the tribes here represented in massachusetts and from you know so many across indian country and you know there's it's 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 crazy to think that um, they tried to kill that, you know, our ways when a lot of things that are here are based upon native ways, life ways. And, you know, it's just important that, you know, we have the support for this um, bill. And um, I know I kind of went off on a different, different things, um, but, you know, even within the school systems. Um, I previously lived out west in the Berkshires and you know, in the school system there, I worked in the school system as a sub teacher and as a one-on-one. -on -one. And when you know, certain times would come up, um, we did have teachers that were willing to work and went the extra mile to ask, you know, is this appropriate? You know, the way they taught, um, about certain times of the year, you know, whether it be Thanksgiving or Columbus Day, you know, what not to do. Um, and, and you have those in some schools and in some schools you do not. And in some schools, you know, they're overcrowded and, you know, the resources aren't there, the textbooks aren't there. And, you know, there's just so many, so many things that need to, you know, be supported. And, you know, this commission with these different um, department people and the seven uh, that will be put on by the Commission of Indian Affairs. You know, it's very important um, to help our students, our our Native people, Alaskan Natives, you know, to be successful and to have those resources. And so I just encourage you to support it. Thank you for your time. That's two cuts. Thank you so much um, for that introduction and explanation. And I, I just, something that sticks with me always with education is reflecting on uh, the youth as our next generation of leaders. And if we don't support them, if we don't uplift them, we truly have no future. So um, the urgency is very there. Um, 